Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Good evening. My name is Goff from Beer Nuts Productions, a production company based on the Gold Coast. I'll tell you a bit about my work and how I got to this point a bit later on. I always find that when I'm, edit when, I'm, when I'm directing the actors in my films, they seem to respond better when I'm able to give them a clear example of how I want a line to be delivered or what it is exactly I want. So what I thought I'd do tonight is tell you a little bit about my journey and how I got to be standing here in front of you fine people delivering this well-crafted and thought-out speech. So I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning because I believe that all meaningful employment begins with a good education. I attended Labrador Primary School on the Gold Coast and in my opinion, there is no greater example of inclusive education than that school. Segregation was not even an option and the blind and vision impaired kids did absolutely everything all the other students did without exception. There are two examples I'd like to give that I believe clearly demonstrates how impactful Labrador was, not just for me, but for all the children who went there. When I was about seven, I was given a miniscope. Now, for those of you who don't know what that is, a miniscope is a one-eyed binocular that allowed me to see the blackboard, so I was able to copy down work into my books. Now, because the teacher knew that a bunch of seven-year-olds were going to be confused by this kid holding up this strange-looking device, she got them all in a line and gave each and every child a turn at using it. Not just that, she clearly explained what it was and why I needed it. Now, because of her actions, there was no bullying or disruption and life carried on as normal. But I think the best example I can give of how Labrador best promoted a fully inclusive environment was that in my final year, I was voted school captain by my peers. Now, surely there can be no greater uh, example of how successful an inclusive education system can work than that. Now I'm older, I firmly believe that if one of those students had a business and were hiring staff, they would think back to their primary school days and they would say to themselves, well, I went to school with a blind kid and you know, he did all the same work that we did and he got along with all the other students fine. In fact, I even voted for him as school captain. So instead of dismissing a blind person out of hand, they would happily interview them and consider them for any position as an equal. So after Labrador, I attended Miami High School. Now sadly, Miami did not promote an inclusive environment. The students with disabilities were put in a section of the school away from the other students. We were not allowed to participate in any kind of physical education. I was denied audio books and then would be failed on the reading section of the English curriculum. And worst of all, I was not allowed to sit exams. So as a teenager, being segregated and ostracized from the school community, meant that I was walking around with a target on my chest for bullies and being put in the too hard basket by the teachers meant that my education suffered. Put those two things together and it doesn't do much for a young person's self-confidence and self-worth. And of course, if you're not allowed to sit exams, you can't graduate with an accurate OP score, as it's called in Queensland. And of course, if you don't have that, your employment opportunities are going to be limited, not to mention if you wish to pursue with higher education. In my final year of school, they teamed me up with a disability job agency. The guy was less than impressed when I told him my plans for the future was to be a scriptwriter and filmmaker. I remember him, quite insultingly, telling me a story of a kid he helped gain employment who was desperate to work on a sea trawler. So being the brilliant job finder that he was, he got this kid his dream job. But on his first day, this kid got seasick. So maybe his dream job wasn't really for him, he said to me quite patronisingly. I hated him immediately. <laughs> so I compromised and said, get me something in radio, preferably audio production. So he came back to me in March, four months after school had finished the previous November, and said that he'd lined me up a job at a radio station as an assistant commercial and promo producer, basically making the station's ads and promos. The only catch was minimum wage at the time was 15 something an hour and the radio station would only employ me if I got paid $10 an hour. He informed me that I was never going to get a better deal and I needed to take it as he wasn't going to assist me any further. So being 18 and not fully understanding my rights, I signed the contract and began working for the radio station. Now working for the radio station taught me some wonderful skills. It taught me how to edit and it also taught me how to direct talent. 
If a client wants a voiceover to be done in a certain way, it was my responsibility to make sure that the voiceover artist read the ad in that way. Give you a chance to catch up. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but while I was working at the radio station, I'd also signed up with a talent agent and they would occasionally send me out for a TV commercial or for some extra work. And at night time, I was doing stand-up comedy at local bars and comedy clubs. And most importantly, I was also writing scripts in my spare time. So when I finished high school, I had four jobs, none of which paid a livable income, but all of which taught me some valuable lessons going forward. So when I was 21, I decided I'd had a gutful of being discriminated by this uh, radio station and decided to take my stand-up comedy show on the road. So I contacted booking agents in Canada, the USA and the UK, and for the next three years I toured the world as a stand-up comedian. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful work Guide Dogs Australia do. For one hour a week, for all 12 years I was at school, somebody from Guide Dogs would come out and do orientation and mobility training with me. Now, for those of you who don't know what's involved with O&M training, it's teaching me basic life skills, such as how to cross a road safely, how to catch public transport safely, how to read maps, basically how to get around. I remember my final exam, I guess you'd call it. I had to get the bus to the train station, get the train up to Brisbane, walk around Brisbane collecting certain items, kind of like a scavenger hunt, and then get the train back to the Gold Coast and then the bus back to school. Doing this O&M training was priceless, and I believe I wouldn't have had the skills or confidence to work and travel overseas without it. I also found overseas that people's attitudes towards me and my disability were far more welcoming than I'd experienced here in Australia. In fact, there's a part of me that believes I'd still be working and living in the USA today if my work visa had been renewed instead of rejected. So when I, so when I uh, returned to Australia in 2005, I needed a job. So why not two of the countries a stand-up comedian, I'm sure, is the obvious question you're all asking. Firstly, it's a large country, so there's a lot of travelling involved. And so with any stand-up comedy show, there will always be two or three comedians on the bill. But unlike overseas, where the fellow comedians were happy to give me a ride from town to town and gig to gig, the Australian comedians were not. Not even when I'd explain my disability would they assist. That's your problem, would be their attitude. The second problem was the agents. Again, unlike overseas, they were not prepared to pay travelling expenses, etc. Again, not even when I'd explain my disability would they assist. Perhaps it's a shame none of these people attended a place like Labrador Primary School. So the hunt for a job commenced. The first port of call was the newspaper ads. Now, getting a job interview was never an issue. As I'm sure you've all gathered by now, talking's not a problem for me. So I attended many job interviews, mainly for call centre and telemarketing work. But I'd get the same ignorant and, quite frankly, offensive response each time. I don't think this job is really for you, said in the most condescending tone they could muster. Firstly, how dare they tell me what I can and can't do? They don't even know me. And secondly, everything was fine over the phone, but the second they realised I couldn't see, they didn't want to know. In fact, one company hired me and then when I was filling out their insurance form and I had to tick a box that said blind or vision impaired, they sacked me on the spot, told they'd change their mind. Again, I make the point, think about what this blatant discrimination does to a young person's self-esteem. So I went to several privately run job agencies, but none of them would take me on because finding a blind guy work was just too hard. So I went to several disability run job agencies, but again, they were less than keen to take me on. So while all of this was going on, I was still writing my scripts and I'd started up Beer Nuts Productions, my production company. I'd also started sending out scripts to TV networks and film producers, but with little success. And of course, a brother needs to eat. So the hunt for a job continued. So I went to a state-run job agency and the guy there was really nice, an older man who I liked because he was honest and direct. So I told him my story and what I had done employment-wise in the past and he said to me, look, I can get you a, I can put you on the books if you want, but your chances of finding a job are pretty much zero. But the good news for you is, you've got skills that don't require you to be employed by somebody else. 
you've already started up your own production company, my advice is to put every ounce of energy you have into that because the only chance of employment you have is self-employment. I appreciated the fact he was honest and didn't dismiss me out of hand like others or was condescending or patronising. So I took his advice and over the next four years, I sent out scripts and pitches to every production company, distribution company, and network you could possibly imagine, even private investors. But because, but because of my disability, they didn't want to know. Finally, in mid-2010, I decided that I'd pull all my funds together and I'd make a documentary about disability and mental health. I entitled the documentary, I Will Not Go Quietly, and using my own story as a template, I put interviews with 24 experts in a range of different fields around it. Once complete, I sent the documentary out to film producers and networks and distributors, again, all over the world, but because they found the subject matter too confronting, I wasn't able to get it commercially released. So I had this film, but no way for people to view it. So I thought, why not put it up on my website and then anybody from all over the world can just download a copy. So that's what I did and it received a brilliant reaction. Since 2010, I've gone on to make 13 short film projects, write and produce eight audio downloads, and write five books, all of which can be downloaded directly off the Beer Nuts Productions website. So my business model is a simple one. The profits from the previous project go on to make the next project. I'm also my own production company and distributor, and with no third party involvement, it means I get to make what I want, when I want, how I want. Total freedom, which is nice after so many years of rejection. So take what you will from my journey, but above all, make sure you go and visit beernutsproductions.com, because a brother still needs to eat. Thank you very much.